Good afternoon. Um, today we are uh, continuing uh, our fifth message from the Book of Romans. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, we spent last two sessions, and including today three sessions, on the topic of sin and judgment of God. Okay, I want to just pause for a second because maybe the last time you thought about that was last Sunday. Okay, maybe you've been thinking about it throughout the week. Okay, whatever the case may be, today uh, I just want to start with this statement. God has the final saying. I just want to start with that statement. Okay. You may be, we always, uh, you, we always like to say, I think this is the way it is. Or you say, no, 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 no. This is the way it is. We, ha we all have different opinions and guesses and things like that. But at the end of the day, God has the final saying. And Romans chapter 3 is the final saying of doctrine of humanity, all humanity. Okay? So I think it's worth paying attention okay? because I don't think it's unclear. It is rather clear. Okay? So this is how God views all men. Doctrine of humanity, doctrine of sin, doctrine of salvation. Okay? So you could put aside your guesses. I mean, you may need to still struggle with that, okay, and try to work it out in your heart. But I think what we are about to share today from Romans chapter 3 is sort of like the conclusion or the verdict, if you will. If you go to a court of law, the judge finally makes the verdict. The verdict. The verdict is no one will be justified. No one will be justified in the sight of God. Dot, 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 of course. Okay, dot, 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 of course. No one will be justified. In other words, there are people who's been going to church all your life, like myself, almost all my life. And then there are someone who just walked into the church. And we think, we try to kind of compare. Oh, he's much more religious. He's much more holier, okay? But in God's sight, no, no one will be righteous, da, 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 okay? So he has the final saying. So today, <clears throat> with the title of the message, No One Will Be Righteous in the Sight of God, I want to have a just, uh, I want to just have some review. For those of you who are joining for the first time, we had four messages so far. And I don't know exactly how many messages we will have by the time we finish it next year. Maybe 20, 25 messages. I'm, I'm not sure. But I want to review the uh, last four sessions. So if you could just listen carefully. The gospel is the gospel of God. Okay? It sounds so cliche that you don't really feel what that, what that is saying. The gospel is gospel of God. Not gospel of CNN. Not gospel good news of ABC, uh, you know, eyewitness news. But it is the gospel of God. What He has to say. So I hope you are hearing this. And the gospel means good news. Okay, euangelion. Meaning, it's not suggestions. When you listen to uh, Fox News, uh, I, li I, I, I like to watch Fox News or CNN. When you listen to that, do they give you suggestions, religious suggestions? No. They give you what is happening in the world, facts, realities, what happened, right? That's what the news is. It is different than you should be religious, you should do this, you should do that. It's not none of those. God's gospel is about a person. And it's about what that person has done. Okay, not religious suggestions. Secondly, the uh, gospel is the power of God. How powerful is God? Can you save yourself? Can you heal yourself? 
You know, at the end of the day, when you come to think about how powerful you are, as I'm getting older, the more I, I get older, I realize there aren't a whole lot of things that is in my hand. There aren't a whole lot of, not even my children. Church, of course, let alone the world, right? But power of God, who could save you? from sin and death, hell, Satan. Who could save you? The gospel is about salvation, okay? The entire book of Romans is about salvation or justification. You could pretty much interchange two words. Although there are different meanings, salvation is by grace and grace alone. In other words, God has to do it, okay? So, it is the power of God, dunamis, or dynamite, of all-powerful, all-present, omniscient, which means He knows all things, right? Holy, almighty, to save for the salvation of humanity, that's you and I, who are pretty much wicked, Bible says, uh, Romans 1, 2, 3, deserving, rebelling, despising, Wrath holding up. Dust, creature, nothing. And the question is, from what? Salvation from what? When we say salvation from what? What are you saved from? Okay, hell, sin, Satan, right? And misery of life, hatred. All of those are true, but the scripture says very clearly in Romans chapter 2, you are saved from the wrath of God, judgment of God. Okay, and we shared last week, God's judgment nature is your hope. That's the gospel. And those of you, those of you missed it, probably thinking, how is that so? The, the whole meaning of judgment is to fix it right. If He leaves you and I alone as messed up with sin, we are hopeless, basically. Right? But the judgment of God brings hope. And He has done it. And He has shown the judgment. Okay? So let me continue. Uh, but the Scripture says salvation is from God Himself. Isn't that kind of weird? Right? God saves and God saves from God. Or the judgment of God. That's the proper theology of Christianity. Okay? Last two weeks... And especially the latter half of chapter 1, God's wrath is revealed against all unrighteousness. Okay? In chapter 1, we're talking about those who are living irreligiously. Okay? People who are Gentiles, if you will, who do not follow the law. And what happened to them? All these Gentiles, irreligious, secular people who despise the truth, and the Romans conclude, conclude in chapter 1, they deserve to die. And that's what we need to come to. You deserve to die. Okay? And those of you who grew up in church thinking, yeah, they deserve to die. Those bad people, those criminals, those secular people, those party animals, right? They, they, they deserve to die. They, they just live whatever the kind of life they live. But what about you, people who grew up in the church, the Jews? You do the same, chapter 2. Okay? Basically, you are... No, better. That's what the scripture states. And you, you may be thinking, no, we are better. No. The scripture says, you judge others and you do the same. Now think about it, people. Okay? I don't know what aggravates you, right? I don't know what upsets you when you look at other people. But when God sees you, you do the same. It really humbles me. Really humbles me. I do the same. Those fornicators, you do the same. Those thieves, you do the same. Those proud people, you do the same. Those people who always backbites, you do the same. The Bible says you do the same. Do you think you're any better? You do the same. Okay? Do you think you will get away from the judgment of God in chapter 2? It says, those of you who grew up in church, you're not going to get away. The, 
basic teaching of the scripture is, and the judgment seat of God, according, which is according to your life, whether you are a Christian or non-Christian, please look at me, you will stand before Him. Pastors need to stand before Him. Elders need to stand before Him. Praise leaders, you need to stand before Him. All of you. I'm just going over uh, reviewing what we, we talked about last couple weeks, okay? And last week, we talked about, is the judgment of God true? Is that true? All throughout the Scripture. All throughout the Scripture. Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? Who will be participating in this judgment of God? Each and every one of you. Every single one of you. None of you are exempt. You need to stand before the judgment seat of God. Okay? What is the standard? What is the criteria? Basically, your life. How you live. Okay? We talked about this. Salvation is by faith and faith alone, but judgment by works. Let me repeat that. Okay? This is proper Christian theology. Salvation is by faith in Christ and in Christ alone, but judgment is by your life. So how do you reconcile the two? Okay, we talked about this. Reformers in 16th century, they used to teach salvation is by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. I hope it makes sense to you. In fact, if you think about what they are saying, it, gives, it should give you hope. Doesn't it give you hope? Saving faith is not some vague knowledge up here. It's the living power of God in you that gives you a different desire, different focus, and different aspiration in your life so that you, it leads your life from, from here to there and to there to there. And then eventually when you stand before God, you live for the glory of God. Okay? Bible makes it very clear. There are only two types of uh, lifestyle. Okay, Romans chapter 2. One is seeking glory, honor, and immortality. And God will give them eternal life. And, and the other second category of people is those who are seeking self, self-seeking. All you care about is you. Your career, your well-being, your vacation, your good things, your goodies. And you uh, disobey the truth and you follow uh, the unrighteousness. And there's going to be a wrath and fury. Two categories. One who are seeking glory, honor, and immortality. One who are seeking yourself. What's the result? God will give them eternal life. And this camp, God will give you wrath and fury eternally. That's last week. Okay? I don't know. I mean, maybe some of you thought about this topic more than others. But I've been thinking about this all, all throughout the last few months, actually. Even this week, I was thinking about it. So today we would like to conclude chapter 3, okay? Let me just show you, okay? For those of you who are following, as we are suggesting the church, this is the outline that I'm kind of like formulating, okay? Let me just explain quickly. Romans chapter division, it is made, made up of 16 chapters, okay? First is introduction and last is the greeting, okay? You could kind of skip that. And there are five ma main parts, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, there is a theme, 1, 16, 17. I'm going to make this available to all of you, and we're going to do this in Bible studies and small groups and things like that, because if you have structure, it's going to be so much for you to understand. Okay, so with a theme, there are five sections, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Romans 1 through 18 through 320, which is today, is one major section about the wrath of God and the judgment of God, the bad news, okay? And then chapter 3, next week, 321 to chapter 5, is justification and faith, good news, okay? Bad news and good news. Chapter 6, 7, and 8 is mainly about sanctification, okay? What happens after you become justified, okay? And then chapter 9, 10, and 11 is about Israel, sovereignty of God, the plan of God, it's not that difficult. And chapter 12 through 15 is about life as a Christian. So there are five main sections. 
And I, I know I'm going through this fast. And some of you will catch it. Some of you will catch it later. But if you have this kind of division, it's going to re- gonna really help you to understand the book of Romans, okay? So let me read today's text. Uh, this is a, made up of this series of quotations from the Old Testament, meaning this is the Word of God. Okay, let me read it to you. What then? Are we Jews any better, than, better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not even one. Okay? No one understands. No one seeks for God. And all have turned aside together. They have become worthless. And no one does good, not even one. This is the view of God. This is the final saying. Okay? You may disagree. You may have a different opinion. But this is the final saying. This is the conclusion. This is the word of God. Okay? Let me read it one more time. None is righteous. You're definitely not righteous by your own works. Okay? Not even one. No one understands. No one understands. And no one seeks him. Do you see it? No one understands up here, and no one seeks Him, right? No one understands, no one seeks for God, and all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. See, no one understands, no one seeks, no one lives. Pretty, pretty bad. And then it affects your tongue, okay? See, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive their venom of asps, is under their lips, and their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Okay? What's in your heart comes out of your lips, comes out of your tongue. And it's pretty bad. Especially you walk outside, there is a uh, grave. I mean, we've been doing church here for the last nine years, so, you know, the graves don't bother, bother us that much. But basically, the picture is your throat is like an open grave. Have you ever seen an open grave? I have. When I went to um, Rwanda, the country of Rwanda, in 1994, they had a genocide. They killed mil- one million people. And they really used a brutal way of just killing, genociding one million people in 100 days. That's 10,000 people a day. They killed them with something called uh, machete. Okay? This is something that they use to cut grass like this. It's like a big knife. And they chop people down and kill one million people. So there is a genocide memorial tomb, and their grave is open. Whatever the human remains they find, they bring it and put it in there. When, when it is full, they close it and open the next one. They are estimated that room of this size, maybe twice of this size, there are 250 thousand people human remains in that little site it's pretty 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 gross right and Bible is saying your throat is like an open grave your throat that's how you talk you use your tongue to deceive you think you say you love them but you love yourself you want to deceive, right? Your mouth is full of curses and bitterness. It gets even worse. What about your life, your actions? You're busy. Your feet are swift, busy to shed blood, right? In their path are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. And basically, the conclusion There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God in your eyes. God is in this place, right? Do you fear Him? And then the final verdict, last two verses. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, and all of us are under the law, whether you're Jews or Gentiles. Jews have the law, and the Gentile, like, uh, like yourself and I, it's in, written in your heart. You know it is written in your heart. 
right? But you can't do it. In fact, you hate to do it, right? So you're under the law so that every mouth will be stopped. There's something that will be so obvious. When you stand before God, your mouth will be closed. I don't think you'll be able to try to justify yourself and make excuses like we always try to do. Your mouth will be stopped. And the whole world will be held accountable to God. Just think about that for a moment, okay? God will hold you accountable. Every single one of you. Me too. Could there be more urgent thing? Could there be more important thing? Could there be more like disastrous thing? You'll be accountable to God. Right? And then the final verdict. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Koram Deo. You know that expression where we hear that all the time. Before the presence of the Lord. When God sees you, no one will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Okay, I want to explain just a few things, okay, from this text. Okay, today's text is Paul's summary of humanity. This section is made up of a series of quotations from the Old Testament, particularly from Psalms 14 and Isaiah, okay? It's all from the Scripture, which means two things. Number one, it is the view or the assessment of the Bible, of, of you, of humanity. We think differently. The Bible sees us, no, that's you. No one is good. No one seeks God. No one understands God. No one does good. Not even one. You're all under sin. Okay? So it is the view, assessment of the Bible, of the humanity of men, which means, that means you and I, and this is God's view of humanity, doctrine of sin doctrine of humanity until we understand that we don't seek God and we don't seek the gospel think about it okay now let me read uh, you know we, we just read so the first question that Paul asked right here is are we Jews any better okay can you take the word Jew off and the question is are we better are you better Am I better than you? Are you better than me? In, in my eyes, uh, yeah, I'm better than like 70% of the people. And you may be thinking, yeah, I'm better than like 90%. I'm, I'm on the 90 percentile. Right? We, we have that kind of uh, grading system. I think inherently we do have that. But the Bible says, no, no, no. We are not better. We are all saying. We call that doctrine of total depravity every faculty of our being is affected by sin and we are no better when God sees you and I when God sees me and let's say someone who just walked into the church who living in let's say gross sin okay th there's no difference do you understand okay are we any better not at all both Jew and Greeks are under sin Here, here's the word under sin that means two things. It means hupo, under sin, under the dominion, under the power and authority, under the slavery of sin. You are under the dominion of sin, power of sin, authority of sin. And second meaning is, it is under the citizenship of, of, of sin. Now think about it. I don't know what your nationality is. Most of you probably American. Okay? You're an you're American, American citizen. Some of you are not, right? But basically, the Bible states that you are citizens of sin. You're under the dominion of sin, authority of sin. You're liable to uh, his, his, his rule. That's biblical assessment and the verdict of a human being. Okay? You're under the sin. That's why you can't. Love your parents. Although you love, you can't do it. 
That's why you cannot forgive. That's why you, you want to step all over the people and you want to be on top. Right? Under the sin. Under, under the citizenship. You live there and you are part of that country and that's your authority and that's who you are. That's the biblical view of you. Doctrine of humanity. How is everyone doing? That's what, that's what Paul is doing in the first three chapters of Romans. And then he elaborates. You're under the sin, and therefore none is righteous, not even one. No one understands. You really can't understand God. You really don't want to read the Bible. You know why? Because you're under the sin. You really don't want to obey because you're under the sin. You don't understand and you don't seek God. You don't want to do it. You can't do it. In fact, you hate to do it because you're under the sin. No one understands. No one seeks God. And all have turned aside. Together they become worthless. And no one does good, not even one. Yes, I do. I do some good things. Yes, I do. Right? You may be thinking, yes, I do. I give some money to charity and I go to missions at times and I serve this, I serve that. And the Bible says, no, 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 you do that for yourself. You do that for yourself. Well, here, the word is seeking God. But there are a lot of seekers in this room. But here's the distinction. Are you seeking God or are you seeking the benefit from God? Okay, this fine. It may sound like a fine difference, but it's a huge difference. Are you seeking God? What does it mean that you seek God? The, the fact that you seek God is seek the benefit and love for, love for God, which is what we do not do, if you think about it. We may want to seek my peace. We may want to seek my deliverance. You may want to seek my salvation. A lot of different things. But do you seek God from God's view? You don't seek me. You seek for yourself. Okay? We can't do it. We do not want to do it. And we can and we don't seek God because we are under sin. We are slaves. We are under the dominion. We are citizens. That's who you are. I hope you're hearing as, as the Word of God is spoken to your heart, man, I need a Savior. Man, I need a Savior. Oh, man. I need a Savior. I hope that's what you're hearing. So his verdict, let me read it one more time. Every mouth will be stopped. When you stand before God, I don't think you'll be able to open your mouth. I don't think I can because he's omniscient. He knows every single move. He knows every detail of your intention, motivation. It's recorded in the book and his omniscient. I don't think we could open our mouth. And we will be accountable before God. And here is the final ver verdict. No one is righteous in the sight of God by your own works. You know what the Bible is stating? You need a Savior. You need a Savior. You need Messiah. That's what the Scripture is stating. You don't need to improve just a little bit so that you could go to God. You don't need to do a little bit more so that you could be a son of God. No, those are religion. That's not true. Bible is saying that none of you even understand me. You don't seek me. You don't do any good. You can't improve yourself by doing a little bit better and a little bit more. You can't do it. That's a false religion. You need a Savior. That's what the Scripture is just coming down to. Do you see it? Do you see it's unclear? See, no one by works, 
No human being will be justified or saved. Salvation, justified, same words, right? No human being will be saved in his sight because you are under sin. You are haters of God. That's the biblical diagnosis and the verdict of all human beings. Doctrine of humanity. Doctrine of sin. Do you see it? Okay. Oh, so much about good news, right? You, you're like, oh, pastor, you're depressing me every single week. Not my fault. Bibles, Bibles, you know, Bible is like that. But when you think about it, it really prepares you for the good news. It really prepares you for the good news, doesn't it? When you have, let's say, rapidly spreading cancer, and I tell you, you have a flu. Week after week after week. Is that good? I don't think that's good. When you have a rapidly metastasizing cancer, and I tell you, take a couple of Tylenol and come back next week. You're, you're better than those people out there. I think you're doing okay. Is that good? I don't think that's good. But Scripture is stating the true assessment of humanity. No one is good. Not even one. Not me. I know I'm not. He has dealt with me. He's dealing with me. I pray that he will continue to deal with me. Right. Just have a couple of thoughts, uh, implications before we move on and have communion. Okay. okay I better finish. Okay. <laughs> so the question is, are you better? Are, you, are we any better? Now, you don't have to turn your head, but could you take a look at the person next to you? Do you think you're better than the person next, sitting next to you? Can you take a look? Are we better? The person next to you? How about person across the hall? How about, are you better than your, your father? Unbelieving father? How about that husband who is not behaving? Are you better? Are you better than non-Koreans? Koreans. Are you better than other ethnicities? Are you better than non-educated people? Are you better than those proud, stuck-up people? Are you better than those workaholics who's working right now? Are you better than Hispanics? Are you better than Chinese? Are you better than Muslims? Are you better than Japanese? Are you better than addicts? Those pathetic addicts. Are you better? Are you better than those immature people? Are you better than those teenagers? Are you better? Are you better than politicians? Are you better than Mr. Trump? Are you better? The Bible says, no. Not even one. We call that doctrine of total depravity. If that's true, it's going to change how you view other people. Think about it. If that's true and it's registered in your heart by the Spirit of God, it's going to rehumanize. Keller calls that egalitarian view of humanity. So clever. We're pretty much equal in the before the sight of God, people. You're not better. Okay? Doctrine of total depravity, doctrine of sin. You may feel, yes, you may feel I'm better, but not God, not God's view, okay? Not God's view, okay? Uh, why is this important? Two reasons. It is important, this view is important because it gets me, it gets you where you need to be 
for the gospel. Do you hear it? It gets me where I need to be ready for the gospel. In fact, not only where I need to be, I must be to receive the gospel. Okay? The citizenship, dominion, and slavery of sin and Satan for salvation, that will get you where you must be. You understand? And John Gershner put it this way. I think it's beautiful if you could just listen to this. Okay, John Gershner puts it like this. Because of the gospel, the way to God is wide open. It's wide open, people. Okay? No sin can hold him back because God has offered justification or salvation to the ungodly. That's you and I. And now listen to this. Listen to this. Nothing now stands be be between the sinner and God but sinner's good works. Do you hear it? Okay. And then he goes, now listen carefully. All they need is need. And all they must have is nothing. That's so true. You need salvation. All you need is your need for a savior. Desperate need of savior. And all you have to have is nothing. That's Christianity, that's the gospel, okay? Second and last thought I wanna share is this reality and recognition of sin, of humanity, and your guilt is the first great element of the gospel. Let me repeat that, okay? Your awareness, my awareness of this sin and guilt before God it's the first element, according to Romans, of the gospel. John MacArthur, you know, belonging to a Christian church, let me just see. Okay. Belonging to a Christian church is much like it was to be a Jew under the Old Covenant. This is what it means. In the Old, old Covenant, uh, uh, in, in, in the Bible, Jews thought they were special because they have the law. And we think we're special because we go to church. Same thing he's saying. Whoa. Right? And then he explains. Outward identity with those who claim to be God's people, even when they are genuine believers, is in itself of no benefit to an unbeliever. But such a person does have a great advantage above other unbelievers if in a church he's exposed to the sound teaching of God's Word. You go to church, you do have an advantage because you listen to God's Word. Just like the Jews have the law. They did have the advantage. It's not because they are Jews, outward identity. It's not because you go to New Heart or whichever church you go to. But you hear the word, right? Um, John MacArthur is saying, you listen, you're exposed to the sound teaching of God's word. If he does not take advantage of that privilege, however, he makes his guilt and condemnation worse than if he had never heard the gospel. In other words, you hear and you must respond, not suppress the truth. So many just put it off and eventually walk away. Do you hear it? The awareness of sin and condemnation and wrath is the first element of the gospel the church must proclaim. Will prepare people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope you're hearing it. As you're hearing this, I need a 
and Savior. Not, I got to do a little more. I need a Savior. A Savior, right? Broke his body for us. Broken his body for us. Shed his blood for us. Let's pray. Let's bow.